Welcome to the Peer Mentor Training Program, Physical Activity Knowledge, Spinal Cord Injury. In this module, we will be looking closely at the physical activity guidelines for adults with spinal cord injury, how and why they were developed, and the key elements of the recommendations found in the guidelines. Much of the impetus for developing the physical activity guidelines for adults with SCI came from the somewhat shocking results of SHAPE SCI, the study of health and activity in people with SCI based at McMaster University. This epidemiological study of physical activity involved nearly 700 men and women living with SCI in Ontario and found that only 50% of the people with SCI reported doing any physical activity in their leisure time. This includes sports, exercise, play, and so on. Phrased another way, approximately 50% of the people with SCI do not do any physical activity whatsoever. They also found that the participants who reported doing any physical activity at all were doing about 25 minutes per day of moderate intensity activity and about 10 minutes per day of heavy intensity activity. Important findings because for a person to get any health and fitness benefits from being physically active, they must work at a moderate to heavy intensity. The research also looked at the association between physical activity and disease risk. A subset of 75 participants were divided into those who reported no physical activity whatsoever, shown in gray, and the most active people those who did more than 25 minutes per day of physical activity, shown in red. Each group was asked to provide blood samples and participate in body composition analysis. What they found was the active people had a lower body mass or weight, lower percent fat mass or percent FM on the graph, and smaller waist circumference numbers than the inactive people. They also found lower CRP, or C-reactive protein numbers, in the active group. This is a key finding because according to research, people with elevated levels of CRP are at an increased risk of diabetes, hypertension, and cardiovascular disease. The researchers also found that 33% of the inactive group were insulin resistant. An important finding is there is a direct connection between insulin resistance and the risk of type 2 diabetes. As you can see, the active group showed an average of about 9%. The evidence was clear. Being inactive increased a person's risk of disease. 50% of adults with SCI do not do any physical activity whatsoever. Why? As researchers began to ask this question, they found that an important part of adding physical activity into your daily routine was missing. Comprehensive, evidence-based guidelines for physical activity. How much was enough? What kind of exercise? How often? How hard? Etc. These questions needed to be answered. So a team of researchers from across Canada began a comprehensive evaluation of the best available evidence regarding the effects of exercise on fitness among people with SCI. The result was the first ever evidence-based physical activity guidelines or recommendations for any disability and they were launched on March 17, 2011. The recommendations are straightforward. For important fitness benefits, adults with a spinal cord injury should engage in at least 20 minutes of moderate to vigorous intensity aerobic activity two times per week, and strength training exercises two times per week, consisting of three sets of 8 to 10 repetitions of each exercise for each major muscle group. At this time, I would encourage you to stop and take some time to visit the SCI Action Canada website and have a look at the Active Living Resources tab or sidebar. Here, 
you will find the Physical Activity Guidelines page. It is important to become familiar with this page as it houses all the information you will need to confidently discuss physical activity with your mentees. So browse around, have a look, and when you are ready, you can return to the Guidelines module. Welcome back. It is important at this stage to highlight some of the key points made in the preamble of the guidelines. First, that the recommendations in the guidelines are meant for most adults with SCI. These guidelines are appropriate for all healthy adults with chronic spinal cord injury, traumatic or non-traumatic, including tetraplegia and paraplegia, irrespective of gender, race, or ethnicity, or social economic status. Second, that the benefits can only be seen if a person goes beyond the activities of daily living. This is an important point to make when discussing physical activity with a person with SCI. Here, Dr. Audrey Hicks, co-lead of the team that developed the guidelines, and exercise physiology professor at McMaster University, as well as director of the Mac Wheelers program, explains why. Physical activity guidelines for people with SCI represent the minimum thresholds of physical activity in order to attain measurable fitness benefits. So if people do less than the guideline, we can't expect that they're going to get measurable improvements in fitness. However, if somebody is currently very sedentary, we would certainly recommend that you start small and just take a kind of stepping stone approach to achieving the guideline. And once someone's able to follow the guideline, then you should be able to um, see measurable benefits in fitness. So let's look closer at the two main recommendations as outlined in the guidelines. First, there's the aerobic activity component. For important fitness benefits, adults with a spinal cord injury should engage in at least 20 minutes of moderate to vigorous intensity aerobic activity two times per week. Also on the guidelines, you will find some important information on the hows of meeting the re these recommendations. More on them in Module 2. First, Dr. Hicks explains what people can expect in terms of aerobic benefits if they meet the recommendations of 20 minutes twice per week. What they can expect in terms of aerobic benefits will be an improvement in cardiovascular endurance. So that means that for um, the level of fatigue that they might experience if they have to, for example, wheel around the block might be less as they get progressively more fit with respect to their aerobic capacity. Next, and equally important, is that people should engage in strength training activities twice per week, consisting of three sets of eight to ten repetitions of each exercise for each major muscle group, as well as some very important information on how much and how hard these activities need to be in order to see benefits, but more on the hows of strength training activities in Module 3. Again, I encourage you to take some time to visit the SCI Action Canada website and become more familiar with this document before moving on. As a physical education graduate from UBC and someone who has participated in some form of exercise fitness for more than 37 years since my injury, I highly recommend the guidelines. My commitment to a healthy lifestyle has helped me maintain a positive attitude high energy and optimal wellness, allowing me to lead a full and productive life. I hope these guidelines inspire and enable many people with SCI to maintain their health and live life to its fullest. Rick Hansen Congratulations! You have now completed the first module, the guidelines. After you have completed the test of understanding, and when you are ready, you can move on to the next module, Aerobic Activity.